working on the lip sync. What, what was that? And, um, ellipsis. Oh, ellipsis, okay. And I've got, uh, some problems I can give you. Okay. Go ahead. So, the first one, 9x squared plus 4y squared. Plus 36x. Hold on. Minus 24y. Hold, hold on. Hold on. I wasn't expecting that. Just a second. Plus 36x. Yeah. What's the rest Minus of it? Minus 24y. Okay. Plus 36. Equals 0. All right. Okay. What's the general formula for an ellipse? Um, one equals... Now let's start from the left and work to the right. Uh, uh, X minus H squared over... What could be B or A? Right. We'll talk about horizontal ellipses and vertical ellipses. Okay. And what's the rest of it? Uh, y minus k. K always goes with y. y. y minus k. Over b squared. Equals, B1. okay. That's the general format for a horizontal ellipse. So an ellipse that's oriented like that. If you want a vertical ellipse, one that is oriented like that, then you switch the a squared and the b squared. Okay, so you end up with x over b squared plus y over a squared equals 1, if it were at the origin. If it's not at the origin, then you need the x minus h and the y minus k. Okay, so what we have to do is take your equation and put it into either of these two formats. Okay. Okay, and that's the uh, secret. And that's going to require some completing the squares. Yeah, I know how to do that. You know how to do that or you don't know? I do. Okay, well, let's do it. On the, hold on. Uh, boy, I wonder what is going on with my computer here. Why would the erase function all of a sudden be... It, it works, but very slowly. Yeah. Huh. Wow. I wonder if I use... There's two erase functions. Uh, that one doesn't seem to work much at all. Huh. It's almost like, and the longer, wow, the longer I use it, the better it works, which is really puzzling. In other words, 20 minutes from now, I'll bet it's working perfect. But we can begin, and by the time it's working well, I'll be able to erase what's down there. So how, how are we going to rearrange this to get started? All right, so we're going to have 9x squared plus 36x plus 4y squared minus 24y equals minus 36, right? Yeah. Okay, now we're going to complete the squares. We're going to put parentheses around there. But what do you have to do in order to complete the square first? In other words, you cannot... You have to do what? Factor out the 9 and the 4. Yeah, in other words, the coefficient of the squared term has to be 1. And we make it 1 by factoring out the 9 and the 4. So what's the next line? Uh, 9 plus X squared plus 4X plus blank. And we'll leave.
leave, yeah, we're going to leave room to complete the square. Uh, plus 4 parentheses y squared minus 6y, and then another way, and then minus 36. Yeah. The, the key, well, hold on. The key to doing these problems is to make sure you go from line to line without changing anything. In other words, this top line should be the same as the second line, should be the same as the third line. And it is. If I were to start with the third line and distribute, I'd get back to the first line. Okay. So now how do you complete the square? Uh, half of them so x squared plus 4x plus 2 minus 2 squared. How much did I just add to the left side of the equation when I put a 4 in there? Uh, sorry. How much did I add? to the left side of the equation when I wrote plus 4. Because that's messing with the equation. In other words, I've just changed the left side of the equation. By how many? 36. So I have to add 36 over here to balance that out. Yeah. Okay, and the rest of it? Uh, 4 y squared minus Plus nine. It's always plus, because even if it were a and negative you, number. Yeah, then you add another 36. Okay. So now, let me make some space here. Whoops, hold on. Let me go up one. So now, if I start writing here, how can I represent that as a monomial term squared? Or not a monomial term, a, a linear factor squared. Uh, x plus 2 squared, and then 4 y minus 3 squared. And what's on the right so side now? Okay, next step. I, I, would you bring the 9 and 4 down or would you get the 36 to 1? Get the 36, sure. get the 36 to 1. First of all, there's not really much you can do with the 9 and the 4. It's hard to bring that down and it doesn't do any good to bring it down to the denominator until we get this to 1. And you'll notice that when we divide both sides by 36, that's going to bring these down to the denominator anyway. Oh, yeah. It'll bring you down to over yeah. 4. Yeah. They make all these problems nice and uh, whole yeah. numbers e. So what goes here in the denominator? Uh, what goes here? And with ellipses, there is a rule. And that is A always has to be bigger than B. So this is a uh, vertical? Yes. In other words, we didn't find out until just now whether it was horizontal or vertical. Although you can yeah. kind of generally make the assumption that the x term has a 9 in front of it, the y term has a 4 in front of it, so you're going to end up with a bigger denominator under the y, just if you want to go by that. Uh, I never bother to do that because there's a certain process you go from taking that polynomial and put it in into the general format. Once you get it in the general format, then you know whether it's horizontal or vertical because you can see... Uh -huh what A and B are. So what's A? A is 3. B is 2. And then C is the square root of 
Good. Because C is the square root of A squared minus B squared. Okay. That's actually a plus or minus. And in fact, we, we do have two different C's. We have a plus square root of 5 and we have a minus square root of 5. And with ellipses, you do have two different C's, always. Where's my center of the ellipse? Uh, negative 2, 3. That's all we need to graph it. So, I know it's going to be, it's going to start at right there, negative 2, 3. It's going to have an A measurement of 3. So that's going to go up to 6. In other words, that's the major vertex. And it's going to go it's going to go down to 3. That's the minor vertex. So the major just mean greater Yes, whichever one is the larger is the major one. In other words, and I do the same for horizontal. yeah, if you had horizontal, if you had a horizontal, then A is going to be measured along the horizontal, not the vertical. So A is always the longest axis. A is always measured along the longest axis. And, and that's to the vertex. Well, hold on. Let's finish this. Let's finish the minor vertexes. What's the coordinates on that minor vertex? Uh, negative 2, 3, and 4. Uh -huh. And this one is at yeah. 0, 3. I didn't label these. Let me label these. That is at... Uh, minus 2 comma 6 and that one's at minus 2 comma 0 and that allows us to draw our ellipse the only thing missing out of this picture is where my foci are yeah well my foci are right there what's the coordinates on that foci right there Yes, and that is the correct way to write it, just like that. You don't ever want to convert that to a decimal and add it to 3. And this one here? Um, two, three, minus, or five. Yeah, that's why the plus and minus was actually correct when we figured out C. It's because there is a plus and a minus direction. And now we know everything there is to know about that ellipse. Did they ask us anything that we didn't answer yet? I, I, I didn't quite hear you when you uh, read what they were asking for. Yeah, usually they want the seven points. They want the center, the two foci, that's three points, the two major axis and the two minor vertices, rather, and that's seven points. So every yeah. ellipse problem, you're going to want seven points. And that's why I draw those seven points before I draw the ellipse, is might as well mark them out, and then you can draw the ellipse around it. Okay? Yeah. What else you got? Uh, there, uh, is, there is one difficult problem you might get, but let me ask you about before we go any further. And that would be this one. Looks simple enough, right? Yeah. What's A and B? Uh, right now, I just want. No, actually not. In other words, in order to get A and B, you have to get 1 in the numerator. No. 
Right now you've got 4 in this numerator and 9 in this numerator. So it's currently this, right? You can always do that. Well, in order to get rid of the 4, I've got to divide top and bottom by 4. What that gives me, most people will try to make it look like that, but that's not right. It's 1 4. In other words, it can't be the same. In other words, if I'm dividing top and bottom by 4, I'm dividing that by 4. So you end up with 1 fourth up here. You end up with 1 ninth. And that's how you handle a problem like that. Most of the problems they're going to give you are going to be such that when you divide both sides by whatever numbers on the right side of the equation, you end up with a number in the denominator, which is as normal. But in this case, a little different. And the solution is not at all obvious. Uh, which would make a be one half, B be one third. Yeah. Because you're taking the square root of that denominator for your A and B. Mm -hmm. All right. What else should, do you have? All right. So this is kind of reverse. It's find an equation of the OS. Okay. Do they yeah, give you a picture of it? What do they give you? Uh, center at 2, negative 1. And vertex, or vertex at 2, 1 half. Which vertice? It just says one vertex. It just says vertex. Okay. What is it again? 1, 2, comma, 1 half. Okay. And then a minor access of length 2. Okay. That should give us enough yes, yes, yes. information. Yeah. This is going to give us A and B. This is going to give us the center. And that's the three things we need. Is the center. In other words, we know... Give me as much as you can figure out at this point. Uh, x minus 2 squared. It's actually x plus 2. Or, oh yeah. X no, 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 my mistake. I apologize. Uh, Second x one. Plus one. Right. Yeah, or just x plus 1. Y plus 1 or squared y plus one. equals 1. And then I don't even know, I don't even know at this point whether A goes under here or under here. We'll assume that. Now let's figure out what A and B is. So we've got vertex at 2 and another one at 1 half. What's the distance between that, those two vertices? No, there's always two vertices. Yeah, but that's only only get one stuff. Well, let's look at the second piece of information they gave us. The minor axis is a length of two. Well, that means that there's distance of two. Here, let's start at the center. I'm not sure what minor axis is. Okay, I'll tell you. Minor axis. Yeah. Huh. Okay, hold on a minute. Let me think about this. The minor axis is the short. In other words, if I have an ellipse like this, this is the minor axis. If I have an ellipse like this, that's the minor axis. So, so it's always the small axis, okay? 
So that's going to allow me to draw my minor vertices. If, let's do that first. Let's label the center. That center is at 2 comma minus 1. If I know my minor axis is 2, um, well, let's plot this vertex also. That vertex is at 2 comma 1 half. Well, where is that? That's about there. So we know the other one is at 2 negative 2.5. All right. I was going to say, we need more information before we can answer this. You cannot answer this question with those three pieces of information. You have to have both vertexes, and you have to have the minor axis length. So the second vertex you said was what? Two. Negative two and a half. What's the distance? Is this a horizontal or vertical? It is vertical. Correct because the maximum distance comes between minus... Oh, hold on, I didn't draw that right. No, that, I just labeled it wrong. The maximum distance comes between plus a half and minus two and a half, which is a distance of three. Since the, yeah. minor, since the minor axis is two, that means yeah. this has to be a vertical ellipse has to be like that. The way I've drawn it, it looks kind of circular, but you'll notice that that is going to be 0, comma, minus 1, and this one is going to be 4. No, I got that wrong. Hold on. Let me back it up. Do they go out by one from each side of the center? Yeah, exactly. In other words, when they give you a minor axis length of two, that means B is one. Okay, so there's the other side. In other words, that is one comma minus one. And this one is 3, comma, minus 1. And now, if we draw our ellipse, it looks more like a vertical ellipse. And you can see, you can see that the minor axis is 2. In other words, the only thing you have to be careful here is when they give you the minor axis length, that's twice B. That tells you B is 1. Okay, so you know B is 1. And you get A by the distance between plus 1 half, minus 2 and a half, divided by 2. So A is 3 halves. And now, that means what? Hold on a second. If A is bigger than B, then the A squared's got to go under the Y. Uh huh. So what goes under the X is 1. That's 1 squared. What goes under the Y is 9 fourths. Excuse me. This 9 fourths, A is 3 halves, so A squared is 9 fourths. B is 1, so B squared is 1. So that's the equation of the ellipse that I drew. It's got the right center. It's vertical because A is bigger than B. Everything works. The only thing we didn't get is C. Let's see. What's that? It only asks for the equation. 
Oh, it didn't ask for the foci? No, it just asked for the All right. Well, C would be 9 fourths minus 1 or the square root of 5 fourths. Okay. So I'd be able to put the two foci on here. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not, but ellipses have a very interesting reflective property. I, yeah. We don't have much time, so let me get to this. Let's say you had a skating rink in the form of an ellipse. And you were at one foci, and you had a hockey puck or a hockey stick that you were hitting tennis balls, no matter where you aim that tennis ball, it's going to bounce to the other foci. I could aim that tennis ball there, and it's going to bounce to there. I could aim that tennis ball there, and it's going to bounce to there. I could aim it back there, and it's going to bounce to there. If and you're drawing it from one of the foci. As long as you're at one foci and aim it anywhere on the edge, it bounces to the other foci, which is a terrific property to have. Because, um, say if somebody's got a gallstone that needs to be taken out by sound. Well, they put the sound generator right there. They cut off half of the edge of the ellipse. And they put the person right there. And now they turn on the machine and all of the energy coming out of that machine gets reflected and goes exactly to the gallstone. Wow. So, and this has all kinds of them. Uh, virtually every telescope is made with ellipses and parabolas and hyperbolas. They all have extremely interesting reflective properties. If you look at a parabola, all your flashlights are made of parabolas because you put the bulb right there at the foci and all the light energy coming out of the bulb hits there and gets reflected parallel to the vertical axis. So any light that would normally goes there reflects off the reflector light and goes like that. So you end up with all your energy, all your flashlight going out like that. Also, if you're receiving light from stars from outer space, parabola works great because all the light comes in at that angle, hits the edge, and bounces to the foci. If you go outside and look on the top of roofs that have a direct TV dish, they will all be shaped like a per parabolic dish. It will all be in the shape of a parabola. And that's because of that really interesting reflective property that it has. Yeah, that's cool. It is cool. And the other thing that goes with that, let me just say one last thing, is okay. the definition of an ellipse is that the sum of any line drawn from one foci to the other is the same. That distance is the same no matter where you're drawing it. In other words, A plus B equals X plus Y, always. That's the true definition of an ellipse. It's the locus of points such that the distance from one foci reflected off of the edge of the ellipse is the same. And that's, in fact, how you draw an ellipse. There's only one way I know of drawing an ellipse, other than estimating it like I do. And that is to have a piece of string and a pin on one end and plug it there and put something in the middle of the string and draw the ellipse with the flexible string and you end up with a perfect ellipse. Yeah, that's why I need you to share that. Yeah, pretty cool. Ellipses and parabolas and hyperbolas are 
terrifically interesting. Uh, almost all telescopes use all three because they use the parabola to reflect the lights from outer space into a central receiving area, the foci, and then they take all those signals and they bounce them off an elliptical surface to send to another foci, and then they use a hyperbola to send it vertically to your eye. So the math of conic sections is very interesting. And you're probably going to get to hyperbolas next. Yeah, we did parabolas and... Uh, Circles. And ellipses. And so we have a quiz on that. And I actually missed that class today. I don't know what they did today. Parabolas can be... Parabolas, if, if you need help, let me know because... Parabolas, uh, they kind of give you a different general formula than the standard vertex formula that you're used to. Uh, they, yeah. they change it up a little bit to make it so that the foci is in the general equation. And it takes a while, if you're not used to it, switching from the format that you're used to over the last three years, the vertex format, and looking now at the general format for a parabola in conic section format, which has a P in it. It's like 4P instead of Y equals A times X minus H squared plus K, it's 4P times Y minus K equals x minus h squared, with p being the distance to the focus. Yeah. All right. Max, I've taken, I've taken you over. I need to... I'm sorry, what? If you need to go over parabolas, let me know. I'd be happy to go over them, though, with you. If you have any... Can, if you have any confusion on them at all. But um, I will talk to you next time. All right. Thank you. All right. Max. Bye-bye.